usual. I hope it will not be offensive to anyone. If you don't like it, then you don't have to come back tomorrow night. <laughs> the first thing I want everyone to do, I want you to hold your hand out in front of you. Now, what I'm getting ready to ask you to do, I want you to forget who's sitting beside you. I want you to forget who's in front of you or behind you. I want you to just think about you. Now, some of you have bigger hands than others, but I think all of us are going to get that hand pretty full. I want you to just use your imagination now and pretend that you can see something in your hand because I want you to see your sins. Don't think about somebody else's hand. Think about yours. Think about that time that you lost your temper. And you might have said a bad word. Can you see that there in your hand? Think about that time that you used God's name in vain. Think about that time that you were unkind to your husband or your wife. Or to the children. Think about that time that you'd tried for several weeks to stay on the wagon and then you fell off. So you can see yourself drunk. Think of that night your friends offered you some drugs and for that night you just couldn't say no. Think of that night that you were out of town. Nobody would ever know. You cheated on your wife. So you can see that sin of adultery. Think of that person that you cheated, you lied to. Maybe you embezzled some money. Is your hand starting to get full? Now, I'm going to have to stop right there. That's enough to get you thinking. But I want you to hurriedly, hurriedly think and, and put something else in there. Your sin. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your hand. Because, see, you could see what's in your hand. But the person sitting around you couldn't. And you know what all of your sins are. And there are some sins that are private that, that they, your friends don't know. And some of the things you'd be ashamed of if they did know. So I want you to squeeze it real tight. Go ahead, squeeze tight. Squeeze a little bit tighter where that your fingernails are almost digging into your palm there. You squeeze tight one more time, the fingers are starting to ache just a little bit, aren't they? Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn your hand over this way. Because God's got His hand underneath. And He says, just open it up and drop it. Now feel I relax that hand feels that you've given all of your cares all of your troubles to God now when we come to the end of this sermon we're going to sing a song that we call an invitation song what are we inviting you to do we're inviting you to turn your hand over and give it all to God if you've not become a Christian, we're inviting you to become a Christian. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized so that you can come in contact with the blood of Jesus that will wash away all of your sin. That's what allows us to turn our hand over and drop it. Jesus is going to wash it all away. Doesn't matter how dirty I've been, I could have been a murderer, I could have been a prostitute, I could have been a drug addict, I could have been a homosexual. doesn't matter how bad I've been. God says, I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to let you start all over again. So if you've never made the initial steps to become a Christian, we're going to invite you to do that tonight. 
Or if you're here as a Christian, and then when we were going through some of those examples, you saw more in that hand than you realized. Things that you've not repented of. Things that you need tonight to repent of. That tonight you need to say, God, here's all the broken pieces. Put me back together again. So in the very beginning, I'm starting my lesson with that thought. So regardless of what I say during this sermon, I want you to be thinking, we're working towards the end. The man you were talking about just a few moments ago, the lady at the bank today said that they had just ended the prayer. And then he fell over dead. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know how I'm going to die. I'm 71 years old. I, I might have some disease lurking in my body that I know not of. I'm going to be driving after we say amen, and I'm going to be driving for a little over four hours tonight to go towards my home. There might be an automobile accident tonight. I don't know. In two weeks, I get on that big airplane to fly across the ocean to the Philippines. That plane might crash. I don't know. Some terrorist might be walking down the street and choose to shoot me. I don't know. Here's what I do know. I know I'm going to die. I don't know how. I don't know when. Those are not the important questions. The important question is, Bob, are you ready for it? That's the important question. Now I'm going to do a second thing that's very unusual. And anyone that has known Bob in the past knows that Bob professes, I am not a song leader. There's only about twice a year that I lead singing. And that's when I've got about 125 loud, energetic children in front of me at a vacation Bible school. Because if I can get the song started, they'll take over. And they can be enthusiastic, and they can be loud, and I don't have to be a song leader. I said at one of the VBSs, I said, now children, I want you to sing loud because I'm not a song leader. And afterwards, one of the little girls came up to me and said, Brother Bob, if you had really tried, could you have sounded any better? I said, nope. I said, I try to do the best I can preaching, but I'm the first to tell you I'm not a song leader. I know what a doe is. There's some of them out in the field behind my house. But now this do re me, I don't know one of those notes from another note. That's why I appreciate all these men that can lead singing. But what I want to do tonight, we're going to sing a children's song. We're going to sing one of those songs that I lead at Vacation Bible School. Now, how many of you recognize the title there? Now, those of you that know it, I really want to hear you to sing out loud. And I want you to get rid of that dill pickle you've been sucking on. I want you to put a smile on your face. I want you to put joy down in your heart. And sing this like you really mean it. Are you ready? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I'm going to have to stop there because of time. There's about ten verses to this song. And the children love this song. 
And I read in the New Testament that Jesus says we need to become like little children. You know, little children don't have some of the problems that some of us adults do. You might, some little boy might come into the house and he's pouting and he tells mommy, I'm mad at Johnny, he's not going to be my friend anymore. And he goes into the bedroom or the TV room or something. About 10 minutes, he comes back through the kitchen. He grabs two hands full of potato chips. And mommy said, where are you going? He said, I'm going outside to play with Johnny. Well, I thought you were mad at Johnny. No, not anymore. We're friends. Now, if that was an adult, he'd still be mad at Johnny six months later. Jesus said, you need to become like little children. Now, when my children were still at home and young, they're now grown and married, and, but when they were young, uh, we always read the book, All People Are Purple. I wouldn't let my children identify people as being white people or black people or red people or yellow people. All people are purple. And that way we just treat everybody the same. Children don't have prejudice. Adults do. Now, what I want us to do tonight is to try to turn our heart as innocent as we can to see if we can be like little children. And one of the things that we always teach our children, say thank you, don't you do that with your children? Tonight, if you will allow me without feeling that I'm insulting you, I'm going to treat you like that child learned to say thank you. Let's look at a Bible verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 2 through 5, the Apostle Paul is the one doing the writing. Timothy is a preacher. And Paul is writing to the preacher, and here's what he says. There's going to come a time. <coughs> now, <clears throat> this was written 2,000 years ago. But it almost sounds like it's today's newspaper. There's going to come a time that people will be lovers of themselves. They will be lovers of money. They will be boasters. They will be proud. They will be blasphemers. There's going to come a time that some of the teenagers are going to be disobedient to their parents. There's going to come a time that people are going to be unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without any self-control. Now, I could spend a month on that little section right there whether we're talking about that we give up on doing our exercises or we give up on our diet or we give up trying to quit our drugs or trying to quit the alcohol or trying to quit the pornography, we need self-control. Some of us give up on it. There's going to come a time some people are going to be brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now, from such people, turn away. Don't run with these people. If they're corrupt, they'll corrupt you. Now, when we look at this long list, we see that right in the middle of it is ingratitude or unthankful. That is included in the list of offenses or the list of the things that God hates. We don't usually think of that as being a heinous offense to God, but it is. If I haven't learned how to say thank you, God's not happy with me. I'm not yet what I need to be. Now let's look at an Old Testament passage in the book of Deuteronomy. Soon, the uh, children of Israel are going to be crossing the Jordan River, going into the Promised Land. Now, Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, is his fifth book. And Moses is a little concerned. You're going to get over there into the Promised Land. 
you're going to have your own land. You're going to build your own houses. But let's listen to what Moses is warning about. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, and His statutes, which I command you today. Be careful, he says in verse 12, lest when you have eaten and are full, when you have built beautiful houses and dwelt in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, you can sort of pat yourself on the back. Oh boy, I worked hard. Look at me. I've gotten rich. I've got this fancy house. I've got gold and silver and I've got horses and cows and sheep and donkeys and camels. You've done a good job taking care of yourself. But look at what Moses says. In the middle of all that, you forget God. Your heart is lifted up. You forget the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You were a slave. And let me interrupt myself for just a moment. Every one of us here tonight are slaves. But we volunteer to be a slave. We are either a slave to the God of heaven, say, I want to be your servant. A real slave to the devil. But either one of those, we volunteer for that position. God did not make robots. God made human beings. And in each human being, He gave you a brain. He gave you a conscience. He gave you the ability to decide. Choose you this day whom you will serve is a theme that is repeated over and over and over again. Choose you this day who you will serve. Now when I was doing an internship at the, the psych center in Kentucky where I live, I used to work with an awful lot of teenagers that had problems in cursing, problems in lying, already problems with drugs, problems with alcohol, problems with sex. And so many times they would say to me, but, but Preacher Bob, uh, I'm 16 years old, or I'm 17 years old, I'm, I'm 18 years old. I don't, I, I don't know that I can make a commitment for the rest of my life to be good, to do right. That just sounds like too far, too much. I said, yeah, that, that does sound like a whole lot. I said, I'm not asking you for 50 years. I'm not even asking you for 10 years. I'm not even asking you for one Warn you. I'm not even asking you for one month. I'm not even asking you for one week. All I'm asking for is one day. Do you believe if you really set your heart to it and if you try to turn your hand over and give it all to God, do you believe that you can go one day without submitting to the will of the devil? For one day, can you give up your lying? For one day, can you give up your beer? For one day, can you give up your marijuana? Well, yeah, that doesn't sound too hard. One day, that's all I'm asking. Now, when you go to sleep tonight, thank God that you made it through one day. Now, when you wake up tomorrow, will you issue yourself the same challenge? I can do it for one day. And before you know it, those days have extended into weeks and the weeks into months and the months into years. And you're going to really feel good to say, hey, I've been clean now for 25 years. That's what we all want, isn't it? 
to get to a point that we're starting to feel good about ourselves. But you see, Moses was given the warning, don't be thinking about you. Be thinking about God. Give your life to Him. Foreseeing the multiplied blessings of God, he feared that they might forget God. That's easy to do, isn't it? Now let's be honest. Every one of us here tonight want to go to heaven. I, I'm going to assume that. There might be somebody that's trying to trick me, but I, I'm assume, assuming that everybody here wants to go to heaven. We want to do what's good. We want to do what's right. We don't want to be like this warning here uh, that Moses has given to the Israelite. But then I get to stop and think, well, now, Bob, now, wait a minute. You got so busy. While you worked for hours out there, just a few weeks ago, I decided I'm going to transplant my irises. I had 250 iris bulbs to transplant. I got out there and I got to weeding all the flowers and I got to moving this flower over here and moving this bush over here and move the crepe myrtle over here and trim the rose bushes over here and work over here and work over here. And man, I'm so tired. I just, I want to go inside and take a hot shower and go to bed threw my head down on that pillow and I said, whoa, wait a minute, Bob. You've been doing so much taking care of your yard in this house, you haven't even read your Bible today. You haven't prayed as many times today as normally you would try to do. Have you ever had a day like that? Now, do we get out of bed and correct it? Or do we forget God? You see, that's what Moses was afraid of. Now turn your Bibles now to the book of Psalms and we're going to stay in this chapter and finish the sermon with it. In Psalm 100, this chapter brings us back to a spirit of thankfulness and a spirit of a joyful attitude. This is one of the shorter psalms. There's only five verses. But oh, look at how energized our lives would be if we would embrace the message that's in this little chapter. Let's read it together. If you didn't bring a Bible, see if you can find one on the pew. Some of you will have different translations. Some of you will have King James, New American Standard, English Standard, New International. I don't care which version you're reading it out of. I want you to follow along and, and just look at some of these words. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. And we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Now let's take those five verses and real quickly try to make a few applications. Shout joyfully to the, to the Lord. The Hebrew word that is used here is very emphatic, shout. It's because that there is an excitement. We might say praise God, we might say amen. There is something stirring inside you that you are wanting to say, thank you, God. In other words, there are times that we are so aware of God's blessings that we cannot remain quiet. And we should not. Now again, each one of you will be different. You've come from different backgrounds. You've gone to different places. But I want you to stop and think, have you ever been in the midst 
of such an awe-inspiring scene of God's creation that you just naturally wanted to lift your voice in praise to God? I remember the first time that I was in Zimbabwe in Africa and I walked upon this scene, the Victoria Falls that separates Zimbabwe and Zambia. It makes the Niagara Falls look like a mud puddle. This is just a small, small portion of that humongous waterfall. In one day, at this location, I saw about 15 rainbows. And I just wanted to break out singing, hallelujah. Or maybe that you've stood at the Grand Canyon and you've thought about Mr. Noah's flood and how that, that water could cut the crevices here and make this canyon. Or maybe that you've gone to Florida, or maybe you've gone to California, you've gone to Texas, or you've gone to Hawaii. And maybe you've walked on the beach, and you sit down under a palm tree and you watch the sunset. And you say the colors are so beautiful that no artist would ever be able to capture this. This is from the Creator. Or maybe you've walked through the Badlands and you think, this is some strange stuff. Isn't it amazing? <clears throat> Life is not measured by the number of breaths you take, but the number of moments that take your breath away. I saw that sign in the bathroom at Bo's place yesterday. And I said, I'm going to stick that into my sermon. Have you ever had something that just took your breath away? It might be standing in front of a chapel and you look back and there comes your bride. Isn't she beautiful? And is it your heart swelling with love? It might be when you're looking through that glass at the nursery and say, that's my baby. That'll take your breath away. You see, life is not measured by the number of breaths you take, but the number of events that you get to witness, things that you get to see, that those moments take your breath away. Have you ever sung the song, Our God... He is alive. That's in your songbook, isn't it? Did you know the man that wrote that song was a scientist? He was a physicist. He's the man that invented the automobile turn signal. He owns the patent to the waffle iron. He invented many, many different things. 1965, Time Magazine came out with an front page article with the question, is God dead? The next year, Brother Dicus wrote this song. Now, he, he said it wasn't in response to that Time Magazine article, but I thought the timing was perfect. Your God might be dead, but my God is very much alive. Have you ever sung that song, Alleluia? And when you go from the first verse to the second to the third, you just want to get a little bit louder with each one of them. You're praising God. Or what about that song, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. And we raise our voice to express the fullness of our hearts. That's what Psalm 100 is all about. Notice that verse 1 says, Shout joyful to the Lord all the earth. This is a challenge to the entire world to come to terms with who the Creator is. He wants everyone to know Him and to thank Him. I love teaching the book of Job because Job thought with all the trouble he was having, he was a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy man and lost all of his wealth. 
He had ten children and all ten of them were killed at a birthday party. Then he was healthy and he became sick. Why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, let me ask a second question. Why do good things happen to bad people? I don't have time to go further on that. That's a lesson all within itself. But Job started asking God some questions. And God said in chapter 38, uh, Job, do you think you understand everything? Where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I decided that the tide down at the beach would come this far and then it would stop and then go back. Now, I remember from freshman science, I rem- all I remember is the earth of the gravity is pulling against, uh, I mean, the, yeah, the, the gravity of the earth is pulling against the gravity of the moon. And so that's all I had to put on the test, and I could get an A, you know. So, so I know that those two gravities pulling among themselves is, is what's causing that way. But I can't explain it. And God says, and Job, where were you when I created that big bird out there that we call the ostrich? Now, I got pictures here on this computer. I'm not going to have time to show it to you. But I got pictures of me standing on top of an ostrich egg. And God says, Job, where were you when that I designed the ostrich egg? Because the ostrich is not a real smart bird. She'll lay the egg and she'll forget where the eggs are. And so she walks away. Now, the egg's out there in the sand, and the sun gets hot, and so it is going to go ahead and uh, produce a chick. But that egg is designed such that you can stand on it, and it won't break, but when the time for maturity comes, God designed it so that that little bitty chick on the inside, all it has to do is just peck the inside of the egg, and the egg cracks open. Job, where were you when I designed all that? And he just goes through questions and questions. And if I were Job, I'd say, excuse me for asking. I feel so dumb right now. You see, Psalms chapter 100 is to the entire world. God wants you to know he is the creator God. Now, do you remember... Years ago, I, don't, I think they've almost uh, gotten rid of them now, but used to, at all the barber shops, uh, you had a, a little swirly thing out front that had the red and white stripe. Do you know what that represented? You see, back in the medieval days, uh, they didn't have all the wisdom we have today, and so when you get sick, you would go to the barber, and he would take his sharp razor and cut your arm so that you could bleed. They thought by by losing some blood, you could get rid of the disease inside you. Any of you ever been to the barber to let him bleed you? You see, we have, we've learned a lot now. We've discovered, we, we've invented one of these big old, big old, big old high-powered telescopes where that you can see now so many thousands and thousands of miles into outer space. And through that great old big telescope, there's, there's, just, there's one spot out there that doesn't have any stars. Did you know the Bible had already told us that? The Bible had already talked about that empty spot. Oh, I could go on and on. I have a sermon that's based on that. Scientific truths that were in the Bible before scientists ever knew it. Psalms 100 wants the whole world to know who God is. And to shout it. And to shout it joyfully. What has happened to the joy and the thrill of worshiping our God? You look around the average assembly and note that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of joy in some rooms, but tonight we had it, didn't we? We sang it. I've got the joy, joy. Where? Down in my heart. 
I've been to some places they look like they've been weaned on a dill pickle. I'm wanting to try to help people restore the joy. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, get rid of those gloomy faces. Even if you're going to be fasting, don't go around, oh, woe is me, I don't get to eat today. Get rid of those gloomy faces. Put a smile on your face. You look a whole lot better. When joy is in your heart, it's going to reflect on your face. In chapter 2, he says, serve the Lord with gladness. Now, the leading indicator of gratitude is serving. This kind of service is not motivated by guilt. It's not done because you feel forced to do it. Now, let me give an example with all the husbands and wives here tonight. Ladies, let me ask you a question. If we grab your husband and we get, his, get him into a headlock and we get his arm twisted up here behind him and we say, now you will go to your wife and you will say, I love you. And if we're holding him in that position and he finally mumbles it out, okay, okay, I love you, are you really going to appreciate that? But now what if you're in the kitchen stirring the cream corn and he sneaks in behind you and puts his arm around you and leans over and nibbles on your ear a little bit and says, honey, I love you. Now does that mean something to you? See, God is trying to help us change our heart so that we don't feel guilty. The only reason I'm going to worship God is because I feel guilty. The only reason I'm going to worship God is because I don't want John to come to my house and, and scold me. No, he says, you serve the Lord with gladness. Gladness. You're happy to read your Bible. You're happy to go to church. You're happy to sing. You're happy to talk to people about Jesus. When you finally grasp what the Lord has done for you, how can you not serve Him with gladness? I was a sinner. I deserved to die. I deserved to to go to hell. But God, who was rich in His mercy, said, Bob, I want to forgive you. I want to save you. I want to let you start all over again. How can I not spend the rest of my life saying thank you? Thank you. How do we serve Him? By worship and praise, no doubt. We serve Him when we serve others. How are you doing with that? That word that we were using in that song in the very beginning, joy, Jesus, others, you. There's your J-O-Y. Jesus has to come first. You have to come last and put others there in the middle. When's the last time you helped take care of somebody that was sick? When's the last time you went over to pull the weeds out of the garden for somebody that was in the hospital? When's the last time you got a half a dozen men together and went over and helped that widow lady put new shingles on the porch? or to paint the side of the house, or to mow the grass? When's the last time you fixed a pot of stew and took over to that family when there'd been a death? You helped that woman when she came home from the hospital with that new baby? I'm going to stop right there and let you make a list of things that you can do. See, helping those in need is a way that you serve the Lord. And you come before Him with joyful singing. One of the best arguments in favor of congregational a cappella praise is when God's people sing out and sing with joy. I feel sorry for the men that are song leaders. I told you I'm not. I feel sorry for the men that are song leaders and say, now, 
let's sing verse 1 now of this song, and then he starts singing. It sounds like he's doing a solo because people are not ready to join in. People are not ready to sing, and people are not going to sing out. I believe the force of those verses, Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16, is that you sing with thankfulness. Now, is our singing joyful or not? You can tell. It behooves us to work on improving our singing because that's a sermon within itself. Just as important as the sermon that John's going to preach for us. You look at verse 3, know that the Lord Himself is God. Our worship is to engage the mind that God gave us with an intelligent response to the Creator. Now some churches want to entertain you. Now my daughter uh, was a great uh, flautist. Uh, she, play, she was first chair in the flute and in, in the orchestra. She's a great musician. My granddaughter plays the flute. She's learning to play the mandolin now, and uh, or the ukulele now, and then she's fabulous at the piano. She writes some of her own music. She writes the words to her song and puts the music to it. She's great. I love music of all kinds, but the kind of music that God is wanting is to use the brain that He gave us and the vocal cords that He created for us. And he said, sing, 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 sing. Now some churches, they, they have a, 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 a big band. They've got guitars and they've got horns and they've got drums. and It provides wonderful entertainment. But I don't read that that's what God asked for. God wants it to come from our heart and what are we to know? We're to know that God is our Lord. We're to know that He made us. We're to know that we are His sheep. <clears throat> now look at this statement. All of us, I think, want Jesus as our Savior. What does that mean? I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want Him to save me. All of us want Jesus as our Savior. But how many of us want Him as our Lord? Because, see, that means not my will, but your will be done. There's a difference in wanting Him as the Savior and the Lord. None of us can worship as we should until we grasp that God made us as we are. And He continues to make us by remaking us in the image of His Son. We are not the one in charge. I need to learn that. God is the shepherd, and we are the sheep. And that's why he says, enter the gates with thanksgiving. He uses language here that would remind us of the temple. And we come to his presence today through prayer. I get to talk to God. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. And we do it with thanksgiving and with praise. Can we ever truly thank Him enough? Some of us were back over here before services started and I asked about that song, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. If I gave everyone a sheet of paper tonight and I said, now, write down what you consider some of your blessings. Somebody would real quickly say, give me another piece of paper. I'm thankful for Grandma. I'm thankful for Daddy. I'm thankful for my wife, for my husband. I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful for my school teachers. I'm thankful for the freedoms that I have. I'm thankful for food that I eat, for the bed where I sleep. And the list keeps going on and on and on and on. Now, on Sunday, I told you about the little church in Belgium where I preached. Six members, that's all. The little church in Indonesia has only four members, that's all. 
Oh, they'd love to be here tonight. You might think in Steel, Missouri, you might think that this is a small church. Boy, they'd think this is big. Places where I go in China, they don't have a Bible. They can't go to a, a bookstore and buy a Bible. That's a communist country. Do you have a Bible? Do you consider that one of your blessings? Count your blessings, name them one by one. I don't think it's possible to list every blessing that we have. And then he ends the chapter, bless his name. The ultimate way to show honor and tribute to God. There's going to come a day, Paul tells us in the book of Philippians, that every knee is going to bow. But what God wants, He doesn't want you to have to wait till the day of judgment to bow before Jesus. He wants you to do it right now. And that should create an attitude of gratitude. Do you feel thankful tonight? All right, let's wrap it up. Let's end where we started. What's in your hand? And you covered it. You hid it. But now we're going to sing this song to give you the opportunity to get rid of it all. Just turn it over to God. If you will do what God asks you to do, God will remove it and it'll never be brought up again. You'll be forgiven. I don't care how bad you've been, how many sins you've committed, if you're ready to repent and to be baptized, all sins will be gone. If you're here and you lived a few weeks, a few months, a few years doing what was good and doing what was right, but somehow, you got off the path. We're going to sing this song to try to encourage you. Would you like to start all over? You can't handle all the pressures of the world by yourself. You need Jesus. You need your brothers and sisters. If you'd like for one of us to lead a prayer on your behalf, I don't believe in generic prayers. If someone comes forward tonight, we take the name of that brother or that sister to the throne of God. Would you like for us to pray for you right now? Let us know what's on your heart. Let us know of any way we can help. All together we stand and sing.